Welcome to The Lover's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Mike and Ian. And we, as always, are reading through the Aubrey Matron canon of our favorite author, Patrick O'Brien. Ian, we're getting towards, uh, you know, the, the middle of the end for uh, Daniela Admiral. Bring us up to date, sir, if you'd be so kind. It's my pleasure. Is this the middle of the end or the end of the middle? I don't really know. <laughs> what we be. do know is that last time Jack was really worried about Stephen's current expedition ashore in France. And Sophie's letter about his infidelity with Amanda Smith and about the severe reprimand he was facing from the Admiral for letting ships, French ships, um, break out of Brest. Frustrated and longing for battle, Jack had left the squadron during a manoeuvre in heavy weather to chase a prize. He'd captured his privateer in really heavy weather, but had to return to England for repairs, at which point he went to visit Sophie, maybe in the hope of a reconciliation, but she threw him out and he cursed her in return. So, having left that really terrible domestic scene, this week we're going to be back afloat. Jack is waiting for repairs with no ringle on hand. He returns to the squadron just too late to pick up Stephen. He gets to worry, as do we, about how Admiral Stranra views his latest conduct in leaving the squadron. And meanwhile, we learn that Stephen's roundabout homeward journey takes him to London, to Blaine, and to the promise of a new intelligence coup. So Mike, a, a, a short chapter, but some important pieces to set in the right place here. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we're sort of continuing that heavy, heavy chapter, short chapter, heavy chapter. But this is a good one, as you say, Ian. Yeah. Well, and we start with, for me, was, you know, a little bit of jeopardy. It says, you know, two days after the dark of the moon, we read that Jack had been stuck in port and he's, he's trying to get the dockyard to work faster. But now two days after his rendezvous with Stephen, he and the Bologna are rejoining the inshore squadron. And I was, I was, I was a little bit worried. Go, well, wait a minute, who picked up Stephen? Ah, but unfortunately the, the, you know, the suspense doesn't last long. <laughs> the captain of the fleet receives Jack on the flagship compliments Jack on his ship's new sparse as you know, the dockyard's done him well and tells him that the Admiral is very far from well. He's very sick. And so the Admiral's secretary, Mr. Craddock, is going to see Jack. And Mr. Craddock says that Lord Stranra had received Captain Aubrey's letter sent by the Ringle, but he had sent the Ringle to rendezvous with Dr. Matron early because of confidential information that they had received. So apparently there was you know, an earlier pickup arranged. We can stop worrying about Stephen. And I'm sure this has been on Jack's mind. You're right. And the Ringle has not yet reported back. Again, I was like, wait, what? But you know, the captain goes on to say, it may have taken Dr. Matron to the downs. Perhaps if Dr. Matron wanted to report back to London, there was, you know, really favorable wind. So, all right, there we go. Now we're kind of up to date a little bit. Right. But in this really very frustrating way, besides wanting to know what's going to happen with Jack and Sophie, we're thinking what what's really going to happen with Jack and this potential investigation into his conduct by the Admiral. But we're stymied. The Ringle's not there. The Admiral's sick. Stephen's not around. You know, every, every place Jack goes, he's getting kind of blank walls. And it's really frustrating. I think we feel that as well as the readers. J Jack manages to stay very polite and composed, despite what must be all of this frustration. He expresses his hope that the Admiral's feeling comfortable and asks if there are any kind of secondhand reports of the Admiral's observations about the Bologna part and company and chasing after this prize. The Secretary says, well, these are matters outside my province. The, the, the classical replier, the functionary, right? Uh, and says, well, go go see Captain Calvert, captain of the fleet for orders. No comment then from Calvert. Doesn't make any observation about this failure by the Bologna to notice the signal to tack, but joins in with congratulating Jack on his prize. Says that the prize sounds like a genuine stunner. So Calvert shares some of Jack's appreciation for a fine prize, but notes that the Admiral is perhaps the only flag officer in the service to be likely unmoved by a prize. He describes it by saying he is not interested in money. I'm like, this is, we get to dig into this a little bit and, and debate the character of the Admiral here in, in the 
uh, in the characters of Calvert and, and Jack together. Yeah, it, it's fascinating, you know, because we've got this admiral that we know seems to be pretty doggone interested in money. But yeah. Jack has heard this before. He's heard that the admiral's not interested in money. He knows that the admiral has an ample fortune, but that he doesn't, you know, he doesn't spend much money, he doesn't entertain much. And he can't figure out, Jack is wondering, how does this attitude about not being interested in money square with this incredible passion for enclosing larger and larger tracts of common land, really, enclosing what seems like anything that, you know, anybody can get their hands on. Yeah. It kind of, it, it had me scratching my head as well, Ian, a little bit. Yeah. So is, is Jack forming the view somehow that the Admiral's false or duplicitous, you know, that these these two are contradict each other and therefore he's... He's not a straight character. Or are we speculating that there's something more deeper and more fundamental to what the Admiral believes in? Maybe there's some useful insight that Jack could get here if you could figure out what really makes the Admiral take if it's not just plain money. Now, we'll see, I think, later on in the chapter um, as we dig a little bit deeper into what's happening with the Admiral's character. Meanwhile, Calvert says, we're longing for Dr. Maturin's return. Yeah, so are we, mate. And he expresses the Admiral's great confidence in Stephen, orders Jack to return to the naughty step to the inshore squadron. <laughs> and we get this little reflection back of the real world timeline that we're supposed to be in here. He says, even though we're in this late stage in the war, even though Wellington's had this victory, doesn't name which victory, there's still a concern that a brisk northeast wind could allow the French to break out of Brest and defeat this divided fleet that the Admiral commands. So, and I, I can't really work out why at this critical, sensitive, winner-takes-all juncture in the war, they send Jack Aubrey off to do some hydrographic surveying, but that's what happens. He says, you go ashore and uh, s- survey these particular parts of the coast, You know, go find some submerged rocks like the ones that wrecked the Magnificent in 1804. So, Mike, a, a little jacking up of Jeopardy one more time. You know, we mentioned a shipwreck, and pretty soon we start to mention Chekhov, right? Right, uh, we right. mentioned the magnificent. I, I wonder as well whether this is another little breadcrumb pointing us towards C.S. Forrester, because while there was a real world HMS Magnificent, she was a seventy four gun ship of the line launched in seventeen sixty six, uh, struck an uncharted reef off of Brest in eighteen o four. Most of the crew were saved, unlike the Droit de l'Homme, which we heard about earlier in the book. Uh, people were taken prisoner in Hornblow and the Hotspur in the fictional. Hornblower timeline, Hornblower steward Doughty had formerly served aboard the Magnificent. So the Magnificent is another one of these ship names and kind of references to character names that is appearing in the Hornblower timeline. Now, uh, we, we've seen some debate on some of the Facebook groups in the last couple of days. I know I've been jumping in. People going, surely O'Brien hated the idea of Forrester and therefore he can't have been reading Forrester. I, 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 I'm sure that O'Brien wanted us to believe that he was a million miles away from Forrester. But I really bet you any amount of money in your pockets against any amount of money in my pockets that O'Brien read Forrester. He just didn't want to put himself adjacent to Forrester in in the public mind and in his own mind. We've seen references to other Hornblower characters earlier on in the book, but I'm really enjoying my little, uh, little round of Hornblower vibes that I'm getting from references like The Magnificent and all the other earlier things we've had about Admiral Pellew and so on. Right. O'Brien probably read Forrester's books, probably in his own way. I admired them for what they were, and it's uh, it's bubbling to the surface here in the Yellow Admiral. There you go. There you go. Well, Jack uh, says is very low in his spirits. You know that there's there's no definitive word on Stephen. He has still, as you mentioned, he had no idea how the admirals reacted to his having parted company. But O'Brien tells us he plunges back into life at sea. You know, it's this, you know, kind of regular routine, as we've seen so many times before, plus his love of surveying. So he's off doing what he likes. And Jack even wonders to himself, well, wait a minute. I wonder if Stranra likes enclosure the way that Jack likes, you know, settling the bearings of a submarine rock. Jack sees this activity as an absolute good. And he's thinking, you know, maybe the Admiral sees enclosures as an absolute good. Hmm. Now, you know, just for, for you know, a little bit of, of soothing comfort, O'Brien tells us that Jack is assisted by Midshipman Mattering, the latest midshipman to pick up Jack's zeal, earnestness, and enthusiasm for navigation and surveying. So we oh. get a little gentle. Okay, so Jack's got a lot of stuff going on in his life, but 
hey, he's got another midshipman he's influenced into here that's helping him out here. But right. you, know, you were talking, Ian, earlier, like, you know, do we understand a little bit more about the Admiral? What do you think here? Well, th- th- there's a little hint, I think, in the text. Admiral Stranra viewing encroachers as an absolute good, I think, is a reference to Immanuel Kant. So Immanuel Kant's ethics said there there is an, an absolute set of moral rules. I read, I read a nice sort of layman's description of Kantian ethics online that says, uh, Kant believed there are absolute moral rules that could be worked out rationally. These moral rules apply in all situations. Ethical theory is absolutist and doesn't rely on belief in God. So there's something, uh, we don't have to agree with it, but there's something about enclosure that the Admiral believes is, uh, is, is driven by a higher ethical purpose. And he sees chasing prizes as a lower ethical purpose, even though they both seem to be about money. Maybe we're invited to speculate that Admiral stranra has got some higher purpose. I don't think Jack buys it. I don't think I buy it. But it's an interesting little bit of thoughtful, skeptical philosophizing to say, well, maybe this person sees the world differently than I see the world. So if we can ascribe that kind of detachment to Jack, then good on Jack. Well, and a, a mini spoiler for the chapter, I think Sir Joseph Blaine's going to confirm your theory a little yeah, bit later. Let's this see. is absolutist. Yeah, I agree. Uh, well, O'Brien tells us that Jack is comforted by having Mannering help him, and he's also comforted when he sees the Ringle beating into the usual Southwester, you know, returning to the Bologna, even though once he gets his hands on a telescope, he can see that Stephen clearly is not on board. But Jack loves hearing Reed talk about their splendid run up to the Downs using, you know, they're traveling at eight or nine knots most of the time and an estimated 14 knots when the tide was with them. Wow. Reed says, yeah, right, that's flying. Never a dull moment. The doctor in his highest form. So, ah, good oh, doctor. <laughs> it, it's funny. It's, it's satisfying, but also a little bit of a... Uh, kind of false hope. I, I I was a little bit worried for Stephen. Like we've been hearing him referred to all the time. Is he really okay? Well, it's nice to hear that he really is okay and that he's in good form. I'm sure Jack would rather have Stephen in the flesh. But we, we keep coming back to the little small grains of threat and jeopardy for the characters. It seems to be part of the way O'Brien's just keeping a low level of tension going all the way through the book here. What do you think? Oh, I agree. I agree. Absolutely. I kind of, I, I almost wanted him to turn this up just a little bit, but I think, yeah, yeah, you know, I, th- I think, you know, as 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 we'll see, you know, this chapter was not as much about Jack. Just, to, you know, right. I, it almost seems like he wanted to ease our mind a little bit about Jack. Yes, there is true jeopardy here. We'll come back to that. What we really need to do is talk a little bit more about Stephen, which he then goes on to do. Right. So Stephen, al- alive and well, uh, and engaged on his natural occupation, which is intelligence still in high form, has arrived in London. He's two and a half days earlier than he thought he would get there. Uh, He leaves a note for Sir Joseph. He gets a room at their club, and they do what they always do, which is sit together over dinner. Stephen passes on to Sir Joseph something that he'd learned that he says is a real consequence that he wanted to tell in person. Uh, This has to wait, though, because Stephen um, is really, really sharp set. We get this great description of his luxuriating in the dinner, frying onions, frying bacon, sardines, grilling over vine cuttings, the scent of coffee. These things, oh, how they stir my animal desires. I had no dinner. (laughs) So whatever urgent intelligence business is waiting here has to wait a little bit longer while Stephen gets fed. Bless him. Uh, He piles into all of this and steak and kidney pudding, and he notices that the Black's Club recipe for steak and kidney pudding calls for larks and shows Sir Joseph the little wishbone that he takes from his mouth. And Mike, I'm sure it's not a coincidence that we're back with birds again here in this book. Uh, He shows Sir Joseph the wishbone and says, this, for example, is the true Skylark, Alauda Arvensis, not one of the miserable sparrows you find in certain establishments. And Mike, you you know, I've talked about this. There's a couple of different ways to think about why he's dropping in larks all of a sudden. I'm, I'm harking back just to the idea that we had so many bird metaphors in the first couple of chapters with worry angles and all the rest as they were wandering around Jack's estates. But maybe the choice of lark is significant because of recent events as well. What do you think? 
Well, you know, clearly we had Gagan skylarking, you know, yeah. up in the rigging and and that, you know, really kind of came back to me. Oh, my gosh. Skylarking. And again, many, many spoiler alert. We're going to have somebody else skylarking in this chapter shortly. Oh. And, and so maybe it was a little callback and a little point ahead here. And it's fascinating that, you know, there's over 100 different kinds of larks. Yeah. But. You know, Stephen say this one is the true. And sure enough, if you look this up, you know, if you if you go right down to that Latin tag, this is the one that most people refer to when they're referring to a lark. It's a Eurasian skylark. And when you kind of trace down that name, while this Latin is kind of the, the lark of the field, it, it doesn't say lark. Lark comes from kind of the popular use and wow. that also it you know relates to you know, the evolution of words like skylarking and on a lark and going for a lark this you know meaning you know kind of uh, playing around or mischief or prank so that that might be suggestive of this next character here in addition Ooh. to O'Brien once again pulling off another great bird metaphor well done right. Patrick O'Brien and and we're turning on a sixpence we've gone from domestic catastrophe for Jack and Sophie to ongoing career threat for Jack to heavy weather at sea and shipwreck. But all of a sudden we're going to get mischief and, you know, and, and fun and games. It's, it's great. It's great. I love right. it. Now, Stephen recalling himself to his business of the day says, well, I've got some things I'm going to tell you that I think might make your flesh creep. And so Joseph says, well, in that case, we better go back to my place and take some coffee. Now says Sir Stephen, have you ever met an amateur intelligence agent? Um, my antennae twitch already because Sir Joseph is half a step ahead of Stephen. He says, well, are you talking about Diego Diaz? And Stephen, who's as dashed as I'm feeling right now, says, yes, that's the guy. Sir Joseph says, oh, we've seen him everywhere. He's well with most of the women who entertain in London. He knows embassy people. They fight rather shy of him, however, in spite of his grand connections. And Stephen says, yes, he is conspicuous. And we're going to come back to him in a moment after we talk about some Chileans. So we get into the, the whole Chileans of it all. Uh, Stephen says that he had met some Chileans in Peru where O'Higgins and Mendoza and Guzman had vouched for them. These Chileans would like to establish an understanding like the one that England had with the Peruvians, an alliance directed at independence for Chile. And by the way, remember back in the real world, uh, second career for Cochrane, who we all know is the um, the real world avatar for Jack Aubrey. But anyway, set that to one side. Stephen hands over to Sir Joseph his report of all of these conversations and resources and hopes and uh, political views, including views on slavery of these Chileans. He notes that their situation, unlike with the Peruvians, will depend critically on naval or quasi-naval presence, hence the link to Cochrane, so he thought that Sir Joseph, being the, the naval intelligence guy, might like to get those papers along with credentials and letters from their friends in the area in the hope that maybe the matter can be talked over. And I, I, I think Sir Joseph thinks that Stephen's onto something here. Mike, what do you say? Well, I, I do. You know, Sir Joseph assures Stephen that he will indeed talk the matter over. And he, you know, he kind of wants to assess the situation. He asks Stephen how deeply committed these people are compared to the Peruvians. And Stephen, you know, he says they're very committed. He believes the prospects of success are one third greater than in Peru. And we know that Peru came yeah. within a hair of success. And, you know, he reiterates that unlike Peru, Chile, with its mountains and deserts, depends much more on attack and defense by sea. That, you know, ocean mobility is going to be critical here. And Sir Joseph believes, he tells Stephen, you know, I think all the people that supported us last time are going to be enchanted with Stephen's report. Stephen really appreciates that. Yeah. But I, I love yeah. Stephen. Stephen, you know, asked Sir Joseph to please put the report, as, as O'Brien writes, into the proper Whitehall prose, scabrous, flat-footed, with much use of the passive will you not. I may have allowed <laughs> something approaching enthusiasm to creep in. And, you know, I, I remember us, you know, kind of teaching Consulting writing, how it differs around the world. And, and I love this, this description that he used here. It, it, he's, he's absolutely skewering civil service prose, right? The, the, the passive voice is where somebody says, 
you are loved by me. And the active voice is where somebody says, I love you. And British civil service types love the passive voice because it takes away responsibility and agency. And I love the fact that Stephen spotted this and invites Sir Joseph to add it back in as an extra layer of, of bureaucraties. Now, having taken care of how they're going to write, they're also going to take care of how they're going to maintain a little bit of a buzz here. Uh, so the topic turns to coca leaves. And Sir Joseph, who's, who's clearly um, at least partway in with Stephen in appreciating the value of coca from time to time, he says, I'm glad I didn't take them earlier because I wanted to enjoy the meal, but I will take some of them tonight, he says, as I'm reading this report. And he goes on with his own little evaluation of cocaine. How very much their advantages outweigh them. The vivid intensity of reflection, the vividness of life itself, the reduction of commonplace distresses, cares, and even griefs to their proper status. And I have recently found that they enhance one's appreciation of music, particularly of difficult music, to a very high degree. And right, this reminds us of Stephen's experience, finds that his, his score reading and his perfect pitch comes back to him when he's taking coca leaves. And there's some sense here that, you know, we're getting a nuanced view of the use of coca leaves. What do you think? Yeah, I've got to admit, every time I read about this, I think, yeah, we should try this. But then I think, whoa, 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 calm down, young man, calm down. Although it's funny, I was listening to a neuroscience book this week and you know, he was commenting that like processed food, processed drugs are so much stronger and do so much more damage. And he was talking about, and I haven't gone back to check this out, that it's much more difficult to become as addicted to coca if you're merely chewing the leaves than if you're on crack cocaine or, you know, processed cocaine. However, you know, we know, and, you know, I I found myself then deeply involved in academic research about the, you know, the the workers in high altitude in Peru have thought, enough of it. Let's get back to Patrick (laughs) O'Brien, shall we here? (laughs) That's going to mess with your browser history, Mike. Just watch out there. (laughs) Well, you're you're right. You're right. But, (laughs) you know, it's it's funny because I could sort of see students who will go unnamed sitting around the dorm in the 60s and 70s as Blaine and, and uh, Stephen here are t- sitting around talking about their sources of supplies, the differences between the leaves of different regions, the subspecies, and, and each show each other the content of their cocoa leaf pouches. I thought, oh my God, <laughs> this, this sounds somehow like a, a scene that repeats itself through the ages. <laughs> maybe, maybe youngsters with vaping pens out there, you're having this conversation even as we speak. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, no. Well, that, f- thankfully, thankfully, they don't egg each other on too much more in that direction because the conversation turns back to Jack Aubrey as Stephen introduces, uh, reminding him that he's Stephen's particular friend. So the question here is, can Sir Joseph tell Stephen anything about Jack's prospects and the likelihood of him being yellowed, of him being made a, a, an admiral with no squadron appointment. And we've heard this kind of downbeat appraisal of Jack's career prospects from Sir Joseph before. I think we hoped that these days were gone, but these days are actually back again. He could wish, he says, that Jack's prospects were better. He suggests that Jack might want to consider retiring as a post-captain rather than risking the humiliation of being passed over, of being yellowed. And Blaine reminds Stephen that Jack is his own most active and efficient enemy, despite being a brilliant sailor and a brilliant military commander. He reminds Stephen here that Jack rarely says anything in favour of the ministry when he stands up in Parliament. His vote is by no means sure in support of the government. He notes that the legal people at the Admiralty take a different view of defending him in his present legal difficulties, or they would do, if he were a more reliable, as you might say, cast iron, heart of oak supporter of government. So Jack's freewheeling speechifying in the house is harming him here. Now, Stephen can recognize this straight away. He says, I cannot but admit that when he gets up and speaks of corruption in the dockyards and of improper material being used on men of war, he is sometimes regrettably intemperate. And Sir Joseph says, yeah, right, uh, and all the rest of it. He says, what a gift you have for understatement, Stephen. And we get this continued explanation from Blaine that Jack has made powerful enemies outside of the commons, including Lord Stranra in his recent dispatches, who's speaking about neglective duty, about leaving manoeuvres to chase a prize. And he thinks that this particular prize, the one filled with gold dust, might actually cost Jack dearly. 
And might we come back once again to all, all that glisters is not gold and pursuit of money isn't everything in life. No, no, no. And, you know, this is what Jack's wanting to know. How did the Admiral feel? Well, now we know how the Admiral feel. He is, he is you know, selling him right down the river in his official reports here. Yeah. Well, Stephen, now, you know, now he sees that you know, this tension, clear tension between the Admiral and Jack is spilling over, having this harmful effect. And I think he's trying to temper it a little bit. He asks Blaine if he knows how the ill will between Jack and the Admiral developed. And Sir Joseph actually does. He knows, and this is, you know, we're back to what drives the Admiral. He knows the Admiral is a most zealous enclosure of land and had advised his nephew, Captain Griffiths, to enclose the common, a petition that Aubrey defeated in the late stages. Now, the Admiral believes Aubrey set the common people against Griffiths. You know, they burned his stacks, massacred his deer and game, and that Griffiths and his servants are pelted in the village so that, as O'Brien says, his life there is no longer worth living. And he finishes up by saying Stranra sees this unnatural insubordination of the villagers in exactly the same light as naval mutiny. And of course, mm. abhors it. Stranra's word against a serving officer carries great weight with government. <sighs> so, you know, here we go. Now we can kind of see this is, you know, how, uh, you know, we, we haven't, you know, we got a little bit more about enclosures, but we got a lot more about how he's viewing Jack, you know, and, right. and why this is really winding his clock up on multiple levels. Yeah. And I mean, we got the suggestion a couple of chapters ago that all the hay rig burning and poaching and kind of petty abuse of Griffiths was just so much locks, as you might say. Right. But actually it goes deeper than that. And Stranraud does indeed have these kind of deep, high-minded sensibilities about marshalling the resources of the world and the nation, and he's upset by Jack's attitude, not only for his insubordination, but for his, uh, you know, his philosophical opposition. We learn a bit more about Stranraud's status. What what can he do with this disagreement of his? Answer: Quite a lot. He's married very well. He's uh, uh, married to a widowed lady with great estates, even larger than Stranraud's own. These estates and the nine votes in Parliament that they control will go to her idiot son's guardian when she dies. So there's a time limitation on Stranraud's power, but for the time being, it's strong, stronger than Jack's. Stephen asks, is this Admiral an honest and scrupulous man? And Blaine is cautious as he tries to give his assessment. He is much respected, is Stranraud. Blaine hasn't heard anything against him, but, says Blaine, I should not put my hand in the fire for any man as powerful as he has been these many years, so concerned with politics and so passionate in his religion of enclosures, the country's one salvation. There you go. That's the ethical purpose. Enclosures are going to solve, solve the country. We might not agree, but clearly the Admiral takes it deeply and personally. Absolutely. Stephen says he asked because of these orders that had gone out from the squadron, which might have brought Jack back to the squadron before he could vote on the petition. So he's like, wait a minute. You know, he thinks the admiral was playing politics with these orders to keep Jack out of parliament. And Sir Joseph says, you know, I can't express an opinion on that, but I do think that any hardened politician would see that as venial alone, if that. And by venial, you know, we're, we're, we're back into theology here. This is the, you know, the difference between a venial and a mortal sin here. You know, a mortal sin being one that kind of cuts us off from God in some yeah. Christian theology. Venial meaning, yeah, you know, slap on the hand. Uh, yeah. But, you know, so just saying, I, I don't even think it would be that. And certainly a hardened politician wouldn't think about that. So, but then he you know, gives Stephen the bottom line. O'Brien writes, yet scrupulous or something less than scrupulous Admiral Stranraud does not love Captain Jack and his word counts. So we hear this, you know, steady drumbeat of, uh-oh, uh-oh, you know, we're kind of going back to, as you say, Ian, earlier times when Jack had foes high above him in service yeah. that were, you know, really doing bad things to his career. So that, right. that, is, that noose is tightening, if you will. It is, and it adds an extra dimension to the antipathy of Jack's neighbor Griffiths, who votes with his uncle, who inherits the uncle's estates, but not the widow's estates. And upon inheriting, though, 
potential good news, Captain Griffiths loses parliamentary value. He becomes a bigger landowner, but he becomes a less significant uh, indirect influence in the commons. Griffiths then, he says, will become a cipher with a coronet. And he is even more likely than Aubrey to be yellowed. So mm. it's, it's, a, it's a tiny crumb of comfort, but not, not, not really for Aubrey, the, the potential future um, you know, let down for, for Griffiths. That's the key idea, though, this idea that Griffiths, like Jack, is at risk of being yellowed. Stephen and Sir Joseph would both hate to see that happening to Jack. And Sir Joseph thinks that given there's a kindness for Jack in, in Melville, the First Lord, in the Duke of Clarence, maybe a sure appointment could be arranged, something hydrographical, which puts him out of the running for a flag, but includes the possibility of a recall. And Mike, it's funny, just as I'm thinking about this, I'm going back to the flag captain who had sent Jack on this bizarre hydrographical mission inshore. Maybe that's already at work. Maybe there are some people who are friends of Jack's in the fleet, but not Admiral Stranra, who are saying, you go and do some measuring and some maths somewhere and stay quiet for a while. And this is making us uneasy enough, but I don't think we've really got to the heart of it because Blaine says, hang on a second, Stephen, you had hopes of making my flesh creep. And Mike, I, I, I think my, my flesh is creepy enough already. I, I feel the need to refresh my soul a little bit. So why don't we take this chance for a short break and we'll come back when our flesh is a little uncrept. What do you say? <laughs> Great idea. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hold. Well, Stephen had indeed hoped to make Blaine's flesh creep, but the effect, he thinks, might be diminished since Blaine, you know, recognized his villain right away. However, he still says that Blaine may fall senseless to the floor once he hears what he has to say. And Stephen starts by saying that, you know, Don Diego, he doesn't sound like a very formidable villain. And Blaine absolutely agrees. He says, you know, it sounds like a young man. He's given to uncommon high play at gambling houses. He's eager to make political acquaintances. He asks industry questions and he suggests deep private sources of information. He says, now, Diego does know many important people and perhaps they indulge him, he says, with some, in Blaine's words, oddments of more or less confidential information because he's seen as amiable, foolish and a good entertainer. And he says, but Stephen, what do you know about him? So now, now he's, he's, he's waiting for the payoff here. All right. So tell me, Stephen, what am I missing? Right. Right. So here we get the, the the return flow of information from Stephen. This guy, Diego, has titles. He has a fortune. He has amiability. He has important friends. Uh, but Stephen believes that uh, Diego Diaz's appearance of harmless foolishness is assumed. It might have been real before his elder brother was killed at Trafalgar in 1805, before he, Diego, became the only surviving son of a rich Spanish grandee. He and his father had created a branch of Spanish intelligence with him at the head that was concerned chiefly with naval affairs. And Mike, I, I really like this description of Diego. I'm starting to look forward to meeting the guy. He sounds a little bit like a slightly smarter, more fancy Spanish version of Giagiello. You know, like liking high, high living and charming and kind of easygoing. But being at the head of a naval intelligence function in Spain, that's, that's richer than Giagiello ever was. Now, we learn as well that this guy, Diego, had been obsessed with double agents. Stephen's friend Bernard, the one who went with him on the mission to France, had become one of uh, Diego's chief assistants earlier on. Together, they had virtually abolished the French connection. Uh, Diaz had caught somebody called Waller, an English agent. And surprise, surprise, Bernard, the double agent, had not produced any other English agents since then. So... Thank heavens for Bernard being in the right place. But I, right. I wonder, I, I'm fascinated to meet this guy who's kind of turning wheels within wheels in Spanish intelligence. Bernard has told Stephen that Diego has remarkable intuitive powers. He's secretive, but he can be winning when he chooses to be. He's persevering, hardworking, dogged to the last degree in his pursuit, but 
apt to launch into spectacular adventures without always weighing the possible cost. Now, Stephen kind of then goes into his whole mode of operating. He says that he does this through burglaries. And the ones he organized in Paris, he had astonishing results. He gets people to tell him who has important government documents and then through connections to kind of, you know, private detectives and underworld people has these documents stolen. And at this point, he hands Sir Joseph a list of names. And Sir Joseph is going, yes, yes, you know, I see this guy from the foreign office. I see this guy from the treasury. Then he says, wait a minute. These last three guys, they're in my office. And he says, yep. (laughs) And Stephen says, right, they're all men of high standing. Mine says, very high standing. And Stephen says, yeah, these are the men who are in his debt, gambling debts that they can't afford to pay back. So these are the kinds of people who are telling them who are the officials, important officials like you, Sir Joseph, who bring papers home from the office. And then Uh Diego, through his network of private detectives and criminals sets up to have these stolen. You know, these are the guys who are usually kind of, you know, gathering evidence on marital infidelity, but now they're out there gathering these papers. Um, Now he says, sometimes Diego goes along with them. He justifies it by saying that he's the one who'll be able to understand, you know, which papers are most important and need to be collected. But Bernard says he goes along because it excites him. And that he often wears extravagant disguises, which, Stephen says, he may be doing on Friday when he's meant to visit your home, Sir Joseph. Oh, Boom. wow. Now it comes <laughs> all the way around, right? So all of a sudden, somebody's going to break into Sir Joseph's home. We know about it in advance. Yeah. It, on the one hand, this is flesh creep kind of territory, isn't it? But on the other hand, for Sir Joseph, the master spy, this is the mother. He's delighted. Fantastic. This person's going to burgle me. Excellent. When we know about it, we are going to set a trap. So he's got this great plan for disinformation. This is going back to you know Louisa Wogan and Clarissa Oaks and all these great you know poisoning the well kind of intelligence coups that Stephen and Joseph have relished in the past. He's going to plant documents that put half of the Spanish cabinet and all of their top intelligence officers on the English payroll. That'll sort them out. Stephen laughs aloud at that, but suggests to Blaine that they might consider the possibilities of catching him in the act with an undeniable witness, breaking and entering a dwelling by night in possession of stolen property. This might be an even bigger opportunity for blackmail over Diego. This offence of breaking and entering, as Stephen says, is capital. Capital without benefit of clergy, and he has no diplomatic immunity whatever. Tyburn Tree, with perhaps the indulgence of a silken halter, is all he can expect. From the extreme embarrassment of his government, from his family's anguish, to say nothing of his owner's any uneasiness, what concessions may we not expect? Wow. <laughs> De- yeah. Devious Stephen Maturin is back in good form here. So, Mike, a couple of things for us to rewind here and dig into. Um, capital without benefit of clergy. That kind of trips off the tongue, but I hadn't ever really dug into it before we got here. What, what does that come from? Well, it's, it's fascinating. This is something that, you know, it actually comes from Roman times when the Roman emperor converted to Christianity. Right. And all of a sudden there was kind of a special dispensation for like Christian bishops and everything. And it, it went down through, you know, through the ages in, in medieval London you know, what, what it really was talking about was somebody that's convicted of a capital crime, you know, a, a crime for which you would be put to death, could receive a special pardon and escape execution. And the way it usually operated was they were sent not to kind of a civil court, but to an ecclesiastical court where they would be much more lenient with them, that sort of thing. Or, you know, they, they were given leniency by the, you know, sometimes you had a civil magistrate and, and a member of clergy kind of both passing judgment here. So fascinating thing. And and the history of that for our listeners, by all means, dig into that. Uh, The way that evolved is is fascinating here. And then they had this Tyburn tree, Tyburn tree, perhaps with the indulgence of a silken halter. Now, Tyburn tree, important English reference, right? Yeah, very important. The the kind of proverbial, and in this case, real life location for the gallows, the principal place for public executions, where people were hanged in the outskirts of London, in East London, all the way back through 650 years. 
uh, including sometime after these novels are set and many, many centuries before. Tyburn Tree means the end and a long drop at the end of a short rope. So th- this is a prime blackmail opportunity. They've got all the leverage they could e- ever hope for if they can pull this off. Now, Blaine is delighted. That the next question is, how? And Stephen's brain's working at 100 miles an hour here. I know he says, we'll use Pratt, the thief taker. He knows all the private inquirers and all their less presentable associates. He can help arrange everything. Mike, I think we were both a bit unsure about what the everything might mean. Like, it sounds like we already know that Diego's going to do this burglary. Doesn't sound like we need very much apart from maybe some muscle on the scene. So perhaps that's all that Pratt and his associates are going to provide is some security for when this all goes down. This is great, says Blaine, even though Stephen says it could be expensive. Couldn't possibly cost too much, says Blaine. And so... Fast forward to the scene in Sir Joseph Blaine's library at night. Take us there, Mike. Yeah, well, Sir Joseph works at night in this library, and and he you know brings his official papers home. He has this big ma- mahogany cabinet where he stores them and everything else, and he has these two long looking glasses at the far end, looking glasses mirrors. So, and, and, you know, O'Brien even points out that they're kind of big and modern and kind of don't really go with this. But um, he says that the bearded man who's busy trying to pick the lock on Blaine's mahogany cabinet where these papers are stored doesn't notice them or the specimen cases or the enormous bear up against the wall with one arm out ready to receive a hat or an umbrella. Oh, another bear. We love this. Stephen and Sir (laughs) Joseph it turns out, are in this darkened passageway and they're watching through these mirrors. Apparently there's like an inch where they're not silvered so they can kind of see through from the darkened passageway here. And Sir Joseph, all of a sudden, you know, he has to uh, he has to sneeze, and he you know he closes his eyes, contorts his face, you know, to suppress this sneeze. And when he opens his eyes, he sees that the man has a dark lantern, has now opened it up a bit, has pulling this big fat document from the files. So now he's got red-handed, you know, confidential English things. And and we all know watching the news, having confidential documents illegally. Mm. Mm. It's a big no-no down through through the centuries, right? Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Ah, very good. So, and and the, uh, the the chapter wraps up with this brilliant last couple of lines. At this, says O'Brien, The bear flung off its head, drew a crowned truncheon from its bosom, and in a shrill, squeaking voice said, In the king's name, I arrest you! The room was filled with light, with people running. Dark Lantern was pinned, handcuffed, and in the struggle, his foolish beard, in in quotes here, for it was he, Diego, his foolish beard fell off. I will not appear, said Stephen, shaking Sir Joseph's hand. May I inflict myself on you for breakfast? Do, do, my dearest fellow, cried Blaine, laughing for joy. What a coup, what a coup. Oh, dear Lord, what a coup. End of chapter seven. So, Mike, we we did get larks in the end, right? We got an intelligence coup. We got bears. We got half-silvered mirrors. We got fake mustaches and squeaky voices. Again, turning on a sixpence is O'Brien here. Lots of fun in this chapter. It is. It is. You know, I, I never imagined we see somebody else in a bear suit again in the cab, yeah. but here it is. <laughs> Love the squeaky voice policeman. You know, it, 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 it's funny. I, it seems to be, you know, Ian, as we've said, kind of another one of those short interlude chapter, which almost right. seems to be becoming a pattern in this book. And, and I don't remember seeing that in, in earlier books again. And I, I kind of was struggling this week as we're kind of going through this. I'm thinking, the sure thing, it's setting the chess pieces and, and you know, looking ahead, we can't talk about that. Right. I get I get some of it. But there were these two characters, Mannering, who I didn't remember before, yeah. and this Spanish intelligence agent, Diego Diaz. And I thought, well, oh, this will be kind of interesting. You know, maybe we yeah. set these up. But then, slight spoiler alert, turn off for the next five seconds or, or so. We never see them again. No. <laughs> We never hear from them again, again. But we did spend a lot of time on them. We spent a lot of time on a number of other things, but we're in suspense on some major questions still lurking in the book, right? 
Right, we are. The Admiral thinks badly of Jack's decision to, to leave and chase the prize, but we don't know how Jack and Sophie are going to fare. Um, we have a better idea of the jeopardy that Jack's facing about being yellowed. And there, there is this hope that then raises uncertainty. Is he going to go down this route of avoiding public humiliation by taking a commission and going off on some adventure, maybe down in Chile? Um, is he going to accept that his naval career is going to have to go down a side road for now? Now that we understand better the high-minded motivations of the Admiral, where's this feud between Jack and the Admiral and Jack and Griffiths going to go? And what are the implications from this capture of Don Diego if, as Ian and Mike are pointing out here, um, we might never hear about him again? <laughs> right, right. You know, and, and I, I can't help but wonder, you know, it sounds like Blaine and Stephen have got this great thought about what to do with Jack's career and everything. And I'm wondering, you know, how's Jack going to react to any of this? I am not sure that Jack would be completely unside with the idea of, a, of, of an in independent expedition. But those of us who know the Cochrane story know that it's kind of coming. So right, how, right. how are we going to get to the point where Jack is okay with setting his career in abeyance and perhaps going off after a South American campaign? There's a lot still to find out. A diminishing number of chapters left in the book, Mike. Right, right. What do you think? And what do you say then next week to just a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? Well, anticipating the next chapter, I should like that of all things. <laughs> Also comforted when he sees the beetle. Be oh, sorry, the beetle. <laughs> this is not Darwin. All right, sorry, Sam. There, when he sees the ringle beating into the usual southwest.